For as long as men have stood on this earth, they have asked questions about themselves and their fellow men, about the other creatures who inhabit the earth with them, and the plants that grow on it. About the earth and what lies beneath it and beyond it. They have delved into the past and sought ways to make a better future. They have made laws for themselves and tried to discover the laws of nature. They have looked at the world around them and expressed what they have seen in many different ways. And those who have come after have known their thoughts and been influenced by them. In this way, men have journeyed from the known into the unknown, seeking wisdom by many paths. And in this way, they will continue. For every question answered, there are many still unanswered and countless more yet waiting to be asked. No two universities in the world are quite the same. The people who work in them, the subjects they choose to investigate and teach, the size, the location, each of these contributes to giving any university its own special personality. Here at the Australian National University, there's one other factor which accounts probably more than all the rest for the sort of place we are, our strong emphasis on research. The university really has two parts. One is called the School of General Studies, and that's like a traditional university, with its undergraduate and postgraduate students and its staff, who, as well as teaching, carry out their own research projects. The other part is the Institute of Advanced Studies, and here there are no undergraduates, only researchers, both staff and students, employed full-time on research. So research is a strong influence on the life of this university. And although in one sense the School of General Studies and the Institute of Advanced Studies function quite separately from one another, together they make up one community. So the undergraduates can't help but be aware of the advanced work going on all around them, right from the very first day they come here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Professor Gibb Deputy Chairman of the Board of the School of General Studies. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the university. Today, you become members of the university. You enter a world of activities and of values quite unlike any you have ever known before. You assume a greater responsibility than you have ever had before. As an instrument of society, the university has particular aims to teach the learned professions, to carry out research, and to train future scientists and research workers. But most important of all, it exists to give man a critical awareness of himself and the world in which he lives, to doubt the appearance of familiar things, and to learn to look for the reality that may lie hidden underneath to analyse and evaluate unfamiliar things in their own terms, instead of imposing on them the concepts and criteria of one's own experience. To see that often the most important problem is not what's the answer, but what's the question. Your education will come not only from books, but from people, from problems shared as well as from ideas exchanged and from talking as much as from listening. Here you will be asked to think for yourselves, and you may find many of your more cherished ideas and beliefs challenged, even destroyed, in the process. Throughout the ages, men have seen learning as a means by which they could reach an understanding of their world. As knowledge advanced, new compartments were opened, new names coined, new techniques developed, so that eventually 
people came to look on their own special interest as separate from and unrelated to any other. But the closer we get to fundamentals, the more clearly we understand how unreal such an independence is. Those of you entering the Faculty of Science will be immediately aware of this, for scientists do find themselves increasingly able to communicate with one another in terms of these fundamental principles. In the Faculty of Oriental Studies, the approach is based on the understanding that remote cultures, however different from our own, belong in the same world and therefore have a right to appreciation in their own terms. In the Faculty of Law, subjects which stress the totality and function of law in modern society are as important to the course as others which have a more immediate and practical value. In the Faculty of Economics, although the emphasis is on professional training, the student is fundamentally concerned with the principles involved in the use and allocation of resources, whether in a Western or non-Western society. In arts, where the subject range is wider than in any other faculty, classics, mathematics, linguistics, political science, philosophy, all share a common concern that approaches most closely that ages old idea of the value of learning. And when it's finished, what then? For most of you, a new life outside the university, a professional career, commerce, teaching, whatever it is, you will have formed new ideas, new attitudes, new ideals, and these will remain with you wherever you go. But some of you won't leave academic life. Your undergraduate training will become the basic equipment for the task ahead when you cross the threshold into the world of postgraduate research. University House is an important part of the postgraduate world at the ANU. It's the main residence for research students, academic staff, and the many visitors who come from all parts of the world to hold short visiting fellowships here. It was one of the first permanent buildings to be erected on the university site. And from the start, it assumed the function of a faculty club, a place where scholars working in different disciplines or in different aspects of the same discipline could meet and exchange ideas. The Institute of Advanced Studies consists of a number of separate schools devoted to research and to the training of research students, in particular areas of the natural sciences and the social sciences. The director of the Research School of Social Sciences, Professor Partridge, speaks as deputy chairman of the board of the Institute. When the four research schools, which constituted the original Australian National University, were established in 1946, their founders had two main objectives in mind. The first was to try to improve the quality and expand the volume of original work being carried out in Australia. The second was to provide for postgraduate Australian students the facilities as good as any available in overseas universities. In planning and developing their research work, the schools have naturally tried to concentrate on fundamental problems in the medical, physical and social sciences. They have also given great attention to problems of particular national significance for this country. For example, the amount of work that has been done on the political, the economic, the social development of Australia's Asian neighbours. They have also tried to undertake work which could be carried uh, on with advantage in an Australian setting. An obvious example of this is the work of the Mount Stromlo astronomers on the southern heavens. And also they have occasionally taken up problems in order to fill important gaps in the work being carried on in the Australian universities generally. Taking the research work of the research schools and adding to it the research activities of the departments of the School of General Studies, this is obviously a university which is deeply committed to inquiry and discovery. In the ANU today, many questions are being asked and answered. Department of Microbiology, 
John Curtin School of Medical Research. Influenza viruses are a major cause of illness. We can isolate them easily enough, but new forms keep on arising, and this makes it difficult to immunize against them. Question, how do these new forms arise in nature? They arise by spontaneous changes called mutations, which are then acted upon by natural selection. We've now developed a method of making this happen in the lab by injecting an egg with a large number of virus particles and adding specially treated antibody. Only the mutants can grow, and when we've studied these, we've found that as well as being unaffected by the original antibody, they differ from the original strain in their coat proteins to about the same degree as two other variants of influenza virus that occur in nature. Department of Botany, Faculty of Science. Eucalyptus is confined almost entirely to Australia, and yet here it occurs frequently and in a great many species. Question. What relationships exist between the many species of eucalyptus? Experimental hybridization is one way of determining relationship between two species, especially when they are not normally found growing in the same place. Pollen from the species chosen to be the male parent is collected, and, after drying, will be stored until it is required. When the female parent is in flower, its anthers are removed before the pollen is shed to prevent self-fertilization. Only the female part is left, and while this is maturing, the plant is covered to keep away unwanted foreign pollen. After several days, the female parent is ready and the previously collected pollen, which may have been waiting in the deep freeze for as long as two years, is taken to be brushed onto the now receptive stigma. The outcome will depend on the affinity of the parents. If the species are closely related, there is likely to be a high seed set. If there is remote relationship, fertilization won't occur and no seeds will be produced. Department of Geophysics and Geochemistry, Research School of Physical Sciences. Many rocks contain elements which begin to decay radioactively from the time the rock is first formed. Question, how can we use these radioactive clocks to measure the age of the rocks? The original potassium in a rock decays to the gas argon-40 at a known rate. The older the rock, the more argon-40 it will contain. The gas is imprisoned in the solid rock, but it can be extracted, quite simply, by heating the rock under vacuum until it melts and the gas is released. While it is difficult to make a direct measurement of such a small quantity of gas, we can measure, and very accurately too, the ratio of one gas present to another. And as long as we know the amount present of one, we can calculate that of the other. So, to the argon released from the rock, we add another isotope of argon in a known quantity, and the two gases are together purified and collected for measurement. This technique is so sensitive that it can determine the argon present in quantities of less than one millionth of a cc, and by it we are able to date rocks of any age from less than 100,000 years right up to the oldest yet discovered, rocks whose radioactive clocks were started 3,300 million years ago. Department of English, Faculty of Arts. Piers Plowman has a long alliterative poem of 14th century man and his society, written by an impoverished cleric in the reign of Richard II. Question. How closely can we reconstruct the text as the poet left it seven centuries ago? There are more than 25 manuscripts of the final version, some in good condition, some so battered as to be in places illegible. We work from photostats and microfilms, comparing the manuscripts and evaluating the evidence they offer. The poem is an allegory, a testament of faith, written in language which was once simple and colloquial, but now seems remote and obscure. Explanations, References and interpretations are necessary to help a modern reader appreciate fully this medieval answer to the timeless question, how 
is a man to live. And teche me to no trezo, but a tell me this ilka, ho i mi sava mi saula that saint arti holda. When all the trezo's been treated, quoth he, truth is the best. Faculty of Law in the School of General Studies. Outer space and the celestial bodies are coming into man's domain. Soon, laws will be needed to regulate their exploration and use. Question. What are the legal problems involved in drawing up these rules? There is more to law than the study of existing rules. Research into air and space law means thinking ahead so as to be able to help shape the law yet to come. Many problems arise, such as the question of how to define the airspace above any one country. The General Assembly of the United Nations has already passed a resolution declaring that outer space and the celestial bodies should be equally available for exploration and peaceful use by all states. Yet it is internationally recognized that each country has sovereignty in the airspace above its own land mass. How then can we define the upper limit where airspace ends and outer space begins? Department of Anthropology and Sociology, Research School of Pacific Studies. Evidence of Aboriginal occupation of Australia goes back 18,000 years. Question. What changes have occurred in the Aborigines' culture since their first arrival here? In northern Queensland, we found a cave, which had once been a traditional Aboriginal camping site. And in the floor of the cave, we dug a hole. It went down 11 feet to bedrock but it went back 16,000 years in time. The soil was in layers, and each layer was a record of an era. In them lay buried stone relics of the culture of the period. At the bottom were crude tools, useful only for rough scraping. And as we moved up, for 11,000 years, little change. Then, suddenly, signs of a new discovered technique, hafting, the joining of stone to wood. We found then spear points, delicately fashioned barbs, which may have been the teeth of elaborate spears. Knife blades with their cutting edges still sharp. And the greatest surprise of all, an axe head. Department of Indonesian Languages and Literatures, Faculty of Oriental Studies. Modern Indonesia is a young nation still undergoing upheaval and change. Question. How have Indonesian writers reacted to the disturbed times in which they live? The Indonesian language is being transformed by its poets and prose writers into a fully-fledged literary language of the modern world. And their themes and attitudes reveal much of the anguish of the time. Idris, the bitterness of life and loss of morale during the Japanese occupation. Mokhtalubis, the journey of a coward in search of courage. Achtiat Karta Miharja, the loss of religious faith and a bewildered search for new moorings. Pramudya Ananta Tur, the destruction of human values during the guerrilla struggle. Khair al Anwar, the inner world of a symbolist poet, rejecting and rejected by traditional society. Department of Zoology, Faculty of Science. Hydatid parasites normally occur in dogs and sheep, but they can be transmitted to man with fatal results. Question, how can this disease best be studied? A major problem is the danger involved in handling material collected from diseased animals. The best way to overcome this is to try to culture the parasite in a completely closed glass system. We commence by extracting the hydatid organisms from an infected sheep's liver. At this stage, they're in the form of tiny cysts, up to a million of them, and inside each one is an embryonic head. Next, we treat the cysts with various enzymes to free the heads, which now pop out and become very active. We transfer these to a culture bottle containing a nutrient solution. If only a liquid medium is used, the parasite will reform into a cyst, as it does in a sheep and man. But if a solid nutrient is added, 
as in a dog's intestine, the parasite grows into a segmented worm. If we can now make these worms lay eggs, we can study the complete life cycle of the hydatid parasite in controlled and safe conditions. Department of Demography, Research School of Social Sciences. Each year, 50,000 or more Britons emigrate to Australia under the Assisted Passage Scheme. Question, what are the causes and results of this mass movement of people from one side of the globe to the other? Three series of interviews were held over a period of seven years and the answers obtained fed into the university's computer. 900 families and single persons were questioned to find out their reasons for emigrating, their expectations and whether they were realised, how they adjusted to their new country and what changes it brought them. The first interviews were held in the United Kingdom about three or four weeks before the people left for Australia. 18 months after their arrival, the same 900 were questioned again. Seven years after their arrival in Australia, the same group was questioned for a third time, including the ones who had, in the meantime, returned to England. From the results of each of the surveys, and by relating them to one another, we're building up a unique picture of British emigration to Australia and finding out the answers to many questions up till now only guessed at. Department of Astronomy, Research School of Physical Sciences. Most of the stars we can see are new stars, made up of chemical elements scattered into the universe when much older stars disintegrated. But these elements were made by the older stars in nuclear reactions which had been going on at their centres since they themselves were formed, at the very beginning of time. Question, what then were the stars made of when our universe began? There are still stars in our galaxy as old as we believe the entire universe to be. They are distant and slow burning, and the light they give out is many hundreds of times fainter than anything you can see with the naked eye. The big 74-inch telescope, though, can collect a wide beam of light from such a star and concentrate it so that we can photograph its spectrum. An analysis of this spectrum will tell us what the star is made of. Some astronomers think that helium as well as hydrogen was formed at the beginning of time. If this were so, then we would expect to find helium in the oldest stars. But so far we have found that if present at all, it is there in only very small quantities. And this is causing us to rethink quite radically our views of what did take place in that giant explosion with which our universe began. Department of Political Science, Research School of Social Sciences. Some people think the more nations that get nuclear weapons, the greater the likelihood of nuclear war. Others are equally convinced the reverse is true. Question. Is it possible to discover by theoretical means which view is valid? Both views are implicitly mathematical. But the trouble is that no one has yet done the mathematics. And even ignoring such variables as geography and national characteristics, the possibilities implied are far beyond the capacity of any computer. So we've invented a competitive game in which the players represent nations, the dice they play with their winnings, and the players' resources are at stake. Do you wish to redeploy? Blue. Yes, I'll need to strengthen myself against black. Black? No, I don't wish to redeploy. Green. No, it's impossible. Are you all ready? Yes. yes. Right. Please now throw. By considering the results of a large number of games, we can examine different theories of the deterrent balance. Perhaps our conclusions can help to take the game-like element out of international controversy in the real world. Department of Geography, Research School of Pacific Studies. In the western highlands of New Guinea live the Inga, a people who traditionally supported themselves primarily from food grown in their own gardens. For a decade now, they've been encouraged to plant different crops, not to eat, but to sell. Question, how can these people change from a wholly subsistence economy to a part commercial one without disrupting the stability of their traditional way of life? Concerted efforts are being made in New Guinea to introduce cash cropping into a pre-existing economic system. 
the Enga are responding, but not as well as the administration might have hoped. Their cash crop holdings are small, and their harvesting and processing techniques often crude and inefficient. By contrast, in cultivating their staple food, the sweet potato, they have developed for themselves what is probably the most complex and highly evolved horticultural system in Australian New Guinea. Successful because, in spite of its simple technology, it is well adapted to the local environmental and demographic conditions. So they are not lazy or bad farmers, and such contrasting behaviour can be accounted for largely in terms of land shortages and unfamiliarity with new crops, as well as the important consideration that cash cropping and monetary wealth don't necessarily have a place in their system of values. All evidence suggests that if the present system is to accommodate successful cash cropping and still remain stable, a wide variety of adjustments will need to be made to it. And therefore, we believe that it is necessary to understand fully the present system before the cash crop program is implemented. In the years since the university was first created, facilities for research and postgraduate work have increased throughout Australia. The Australian National University has played some part in stimulating and encouraging this progress, and already it has begun to widen the scope of its own activities. An undertaking, unusual for an Australian university, was established to stimulate the output of creative work in Australia. Fellowships in the creative arts. They are available to artists working in any field. Some are for artists living in Australia to free them for a substantial time from economic anxiety and routine tasks. John Percival received the first of these fellowships. Another type is for distinguished artists from abroad, including Australian expatriates, to enable them to be associated with the university for a short period and to make contact with other artists throughout Australia. The Australian National University is still young, but it has grown rapidly, and already many of its original hopes have been fulfilled. It will continue to grow, and as it grows, it will change. But a university must be responsive to its environment and be prepared to adapt itself to the changing needs of the community and the ever-growing sum of human knowledge. For as long as men have stood on this earth, they have asked questions about themselves and their fellow men, about the other creatures who inhabit the earth with them, and the plants that grow on it. About the earth and what lies beneath it and beyond it. They have delved into the past and sought ways to make a better future. They have made laws for themselves and tried to discover the laws of nature. They have looked at the world around them and expressed what they have seen in many different ways. And those who have come after have known their thoughts and been influenced by them. In this way, men have journeyed from the known into the unknown, seeking wisdom by many paths. And in this way, they will continue. For every question answered, there are many still unanswered, and countless more yet waiting to be asked.